Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Adoptions from the Heart TV. I'm your host, Amanda Alberti. Today, we're going to be focusing on one of the tougher sides of adoption. What is a disruption like? We thought it'd be nice to sit down and chat with an adoptive family who actually experienced a disruption to talk a little bit about their journey. So I'd like to welcome Jessica and Ronnie. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. So can you guys start with kind of before you actually experience the disruption, what was your expectation of like what that would look like or how to prepare for it? I guess we always knew that it was was a possibility. We definitely didn't have like a baby shower or anything like that in preparation. We did do what some people try to dissuade you from doing. We did have like a Amazon wish list. So we did have like that going on. And like my my workplace knew um, that we were trying to adopt a baby and had been through um, through the process of um, the application and they knew that uh, we had taken classes. And so they were very invested, I feel like in the, in the journey with me. And so um, we definitely received gifts prior to ever going to the hospital, mm-hmm. people wishing us well. I got big baskets for my best mm-hmm. friend. And I, we constantly told people like, there's possibility of a disruption. There's possibility that it may not work out to try to lay the groundwork because in the back of our minds, we knew that it was always going to be a possibility, but you kind of think that it's never going to be you, even though you tell people like it's a possibility, you're like, you think you want to think the best. And so you never really, you say it, but you never really think it's going to come true kind of thing. Sure. Well, and just to clarify for folks, a disruption is what happens when you're actually placed with a child, you signed off on your placement paperwork, and then the birth parent revokes their consent to the adoption. The child is then removed from the adoptive family's home and they're brought back to the birth parent. Um, So I know initially in our educational process, we teach you guys that a disruption is definitely a risk and something that can happen. But I'm happy, Jessica, that you touched on that because it's one thing to know it can happen. Happen, but it's another thing to actually go through it and think like, can this really happen to me? Can can this happen to my family? Ronnie, how about for you? Like when you initially got that call that you were matched for a Delaware placement, um, had you thought about like, wow, this is risky. Remember, like this may not happen, even though this is a good thing. We still have to prepare for what potentially could happen. Uh, yes, but I would look at the numbers every every month for placements and disruptions and disappointments. And every month it was like one in 10. So I was like, what are the odds? It's, it's, we've got a 90% chance of everything going well. So I was looking at it that way as well, one in 10, we're just not gonna be that one. <laughs> yeah. And your disruption happened in 2020, right? September of 2020? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. How long had you had the baby before it happened? A day and a half? Like a, yeah, like a day and a half. We were still in the hotel room with the baby because we hadn't left. We weren't the really, state. we weren't really conscious at that point either. We were, we were, <laughs> we were very sleep deprived. So it was kind of a, a, a shock for the first two or three minutes of just like, well, what just happened? <laughs> yeah, you're still in that new parent mode, right? Of taking care of baby and figuring out all the logistics and responsibilities. Yeah, in a hotel room. <laughs> So during placement, do you remember our conversation of like talking about that being a risk? Yeah, and the way our placement went, we were kind of waiting for it. Talk to me about that. What what do you mean by that? You were waiting for it. Because the the parents hadn't signed. um, They hadn't talked to their parents. They were younger, so they hadn't talked to their parents yet. And things kind of seemed like they, they were pushing things back at every step, just okay, we'll do it tomorrow. Okay, well, I'll talk to the birth father and we'll do it. They're gonna, he's gonna talk to his parents and we're gonna do it tomorrow again, always pushing it back as if we're not sure yet. Well, and I think that's one of the things we try to do at the agency as social workers. When we do sense there being red flags, we try to be as transparent with you as possible. And I remember sitting down doing placement paperwork with you guys and talking about some of those extra red flags that we were seeing. Do you feel like that helped you at all when you actually got that call and I said to you, hey guys, you know, they changed their mind. They want the baby back. Yep. I was actually, I was actually expecting it. So when I saw your number, I was like, okay, well, and I, I kind of woke her up before. 
mm-hmm. today, I think he's going back. <laughs> Jessica, how did it feel to get that call and know that this child would no longer be yours? It was heartbreaking, honestly. It was really sad um, that because we had emotionally invested in the process of um, like preparing a room for him and making so we once we knew we were matched with a boy, like instead of everything being gender neutral, we had started buying things specific for a boy and um, had prepared this like wonderful room for him. And it just was heartbreaking to know that he was never gonna see it. Yeah. Yours was an emergency placement, right? So you weren't matched for that long. No. It was a couple of weeks, I think yeah. we knew. I think we knew at least in about a month actually. So oh, it was it was a couple of weeks that you had been preparing. So you found out that it was going to be a boy and you decided to kind of get more boy boy things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK, looking back, would you have not done that? Would that be something that maybe you advise folks is to kind of not do as much of that? Actually, yes. Yeah. yeah, keep more gender neutral things, I think. Well, and it's hard because we get you guys excited, right? You're matched for a situation. We talk about all these things that are going to happen. We're trying to prepare you. It's hard to not jump in, right? And get all excited and do all the things that you want to do as you're preparing for a child. But in retrospect, um, you're also trying to safeguard your hearts if this were to occur for you. Um, Ronnie, I remember you were the one who actually came to the hospital and brought the baby back and I handed the baby back to the birth mom. Uh, What was that day like for you? It was kind of numb, actually. But I really felt bad for him more than us at that point. Because I knew we were going back, we're going to just go back on the books and eventually another child was going to come. But I kind of felt like he was getting the raw end of the deal. While we never truly know what the life that this child's going to live when they go back to their birth parents, um, it's still just hard to see a child that's maybe displaced from one home to a different home, right? So that concept can sometimes be hard to take in. Talk to me about birth parents and what you felt for them in that moment when they decided to disrupt and take their child back. I felt like they we're gonna be happy because you know I can see it was a hard decision for them because they were going back and forth and like I said they were pushing back the signature. I can see it was gonna to be tough for them. Kind of stuck in a place where they weren't sure if they could do it or not. We always say for a birth parent when they're going through that revocation period, which is the time period they have to change their mind. Every state the law is different. So in Delaware, it was 14 days that the birth parent would have to change their mind. Um, but For a birth parent, it's almost like your heart is playing against your mind, right? Like your head is telling you, this is the right place for this child. I know this is the right decision for all these reasons, but your heart is pulling for that child. And during that time period, it's a game of which one is going to win. And I think in your instance, the birth parents' hearts pulled hard enough. They felt like this was not the right decision. Um, And they truly felt that that child coming back into their home was the right place for him. How about for you, Jessica? How did that feel knowing that this child was gonna go back to his biological parents? I guess I just wish that we would have known sooner and not have been, had the the time that we had with him because we, you know, bonded and we were just getting like into a routine with the, with the sleep schedule and the eating schedule. And we were just kind of getting to that point since it was, you know, the first time we were ever parents that we were so we were learning along with him like with the expectations from like the pediatrician and following all those rules um we were just kind of starting to feel like we were get kind of building our confidence and (laughs) and and felt like we were doing a really good job and then and then we got the news And it's hard to take. I mean, you can prepare as much as you can. We can know all the risks. We can know all the red flags, but it still hurts. And that's the reality of a disruption. And I think it's important for folks to recognize the emotions that are involved. Talk to me about who you had shared your placement with. Um, Was it hard for you to have to go back to family, friends, and let them know that the disruption occurred? Actually, actually, I had a friend who was more mad than I was, (laughs) who, who was one of our references. And he he was he was livid, and I was like, "It's okay, we're back on the books." And 
So. Well, and sometimes anger is the first emotion that people may feel, whether it's you or your loved ones, because they care about you. They want to see you becoming parents and you immediately get a little bit angry um, just in general about the process, about the risk. And that's hard for folks to take. Yeah, that's something you don't tell them is a possibility. So you know, your friends and family, well, I, actually, I told, we told family, I didn't tell a bunch of friends that that was a possibility and they he was surprised because he knew we were gone and we were in Delaware, we we're going to come home. <clears throat> and he's was him, he was waiting with his kids to see the baby and all. And I was like, God, we're not coming home. Well, and it can be challenging, not only dealing with your emotions involved with a disruption, but also the people around you. Um, Jessica, would you have done anything differently if you could go back? Like, would you have maybe not shared as much with people or would you have shared a little bit more about the risk with your, the people in your life? Um, I feel like we talked about it with, including the people that I work with, we talked about it, but it just wasn't emphasized as much. So like I did as much, I feel like I did a good job of broaching the conversation as much as just not dwelling on it. Um, my workplace back then was very much like a family environment and I kind of, I'd been working there since I was 24. So I kind of grew up in a kind of a way there at that environment and that workplace. Um, so I felt like a lot of the people were kind of like family. And so I probably shared a lot more than um, a lot of people would in their workplace. But definitely I would encourage if people are sharing with their coworkers to definitely share that there is a, a risk of disruption. And because um, I had to go back and like ask people like, it's kind of awkward. Like I had to ask people like, do you want your present back? Um, and like try to be like, professional and personal and, and, you know, like, you know, like acknowledge that the baby didn't come. And of course, nobody wanted their present back. They wanted us to keep it for the next baby, but it's hard to like, think about even the next baby when you're going through the emotional journey of a disruption. Sure. Sure. Let's kind of jump into that. Ha ha talk to me about like hope and, and when you were able to switch gears, go back into the books and start thinking about your next potential match i don't think we ever came out of the books did we yeah we did uh -huh. for like a week i think uh -huh. yeah i was like put us put us back in that day yeah well and sometimes it's good and healthy to just take a minute take some space and digest what just happened and that might have been why your social worker encouraged you to just take the week um when you went back in were you able to switch gears immediately ronnie and just know that like okay this was not our forever baby we're we're moving forward yep i was like that was practice and now we're gonna we're gonna try it again because <laughs> i knew it was a possibility so i was I was ready for that to be a possibility. Just, we got to try it again. I think we definitely went through like a week of like where we took off time from work. Like we didn't go right back to work after the experience. We stayed home and I emotionally wasn't ready to go back to work. What helped for you, Jessica? Just being with Ronnie and kind of talking about it and processing it. Cause I definitely went through like what they say the stages of grief are like I definitely went through like a roller coaster of that like I was really sad depressed one day and then the next day I was angry I was angry at the agency because I felt like why didn't why weren't these red flags highlighted more and you know you go through that stage where you're like you're angry at everybody and then you're you're angry even at the the birth family because you're like well, why did you let us get this far if you knew and so I, I have to say like I have to share that that like I went through like an anger part and then you go through like the bargaining where you're like okay I went through this so now absolutely the next match is going to work out and of course there's you have no control over anything that happens in the future in regards to what's going to happen with the next situation so because yeah, our next one was uh, nail biting also. So what was it like when you got the call the second time uh, for your now forever daughter? Uh, what was it like? Like had the previous disruption affected your emotions at that point? Yes. How so? Because we, well, not just emotion, just the, how, just the way we were thinking, because we had some of the similar red flags for hers where they weren't ready to sign instantly. And we kind of had to push that back a day or so and do another interview with the family. And it was an emergency placement too, so. In the same state. Yeah. <laughs> 
So we and in the same month. Yep. So it was almost later. exactly a year. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. almost like there were some like triggers of things that were very similar to the first placement slash disruption the second time around. Would you say that you were more like guarded going in? Yes. Yeah. When I think even as an agency, we try our best to like provide that extra cushion to families who have experienced a disruption. Like if I know a family was previously disrupted, I try to get a little bit of a storyline of what happened when I'm doing placement the next time, just because I wanna make sure we're covering those angles as much as we can. Sometimes it's completely out of your control, right? And like a red flag for one situation is not a red flag for something else, but we try hard to address those things and provide as much transparency, even more transparency the second time around. Um, so what ended up happening? Did everything go through? Yes. But you can be transparent. Go ahead. <laughs> it felt like the same situation. Yeah. Just we got lucky this time. <laughs> yep. So yeah, the birth parents and birth grandparents, this is kind of what happened on our first one weren't sure if they wanted to go through because they were like well we don't we want to we want to parent well actually the grandparent birth grandparents wanted to parent just like our last time and they pushed it back and pushed it back until they actually grandparents interviewed us and that's when it went through so luckily everything went the way it was supposed to go and your daughter is now how old? 15, 15 months. 15 months. Well, and we always say everything is supposed to happen when it's supposed to happen, right? And what's meant to be will be. So I think regardless of the hurdles that you went through again, the second time around, this was supposed to happen. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Yeah. Um, what what advice would you give families who are in the books and are really anxious and scared of what would a disruption feel like? Like, what would you say to them as your biggest piece of advice? I guess just trust the process that the right baby is going to come at the right time for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, any specific support that really helped you that you would want other families to have? Um, I'd say we have really good family support um, and our friends and just kind of, especially when the disruption went through to just try your best to immerse yourself in that love um, so that it'll help you process the loss. Because that's what it is, it's a loss. Make sure you put all the pictures you take in a folder that you can delete so that pictures don't just pop up randomly. That's smart on your phone. Yeah. That's like, very smart. I didn't think of that. So like the pictures you take of the child during those first few days, put them in a special folder so you can delete them. Yep. Because they'll pop up a year later or six months later in other other files or like a Google Google memory or something like that. Great, a great um tool to have to do. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, just going off of support too, just making sure that the people in your life, like know the risk, right? Like we educate you guys through this process. But sometimes the people around you don't. Uh, yeah. or <laughs> that education. So just making sure that they understand what's happening and that this is not your, your baby yet. Right. Even when you're matched and placed with a child and you leave that hospital, you're babysitting that baby until these birth parents fully decide that that's what they want. Yep. You know, and, and reminding yourself of that. Okay. Any other final thoughts, anything else you guys want to share about your experience? Um, I definitely think about the little guy every once in a while. Um, he was actually born on the same day of my late father's birthday so when that when it comes around it's kind of it's still a little emotional for me because my father of course is no longer with us and then then I tie in the date with the baby um so I definitely think about him and and think about especially in contrast to the year difference with our our daughter um like I think about that he's like a year like whenever whatever stage that she's at in that time that I'm thinking about him I think that you know 
he's like a year older and I just hope that he's doing the best. Thank you for that. And I actually had followed up with the birth mom probably almost six months later. Um, and he is doing well. And, you know, she's still confident in the decision that she made. And she had referenced many times that she felt bad for what she had to put you guys through, um, which I think is important to note uh, in this discussion. Uh, because while today's focus is really on like the adoptive parent side of things, it's also important to recognize what birth parents go through and their decision making and the sacrifice and, and the loss that they're experiencing. Um, but he is doing well. She was very uh, happy to know that she had the support of the agency as well as your guys' support during that tough time. Um, and I think that ultimately everything happened and resulted the way it was supposed to end. So we're, we're grateful for that. And we're appreciative for families like you who are able to voice this because this is a tough subject. Disruptions are never easy. There's always a risk. It's the hardest part of everyone involved in the process. Um, and I, I think it's important to recognize that there is light at the end of the tunnel. You guys were eventually placed with your forever daughter and we're just happy to see you guys in a good place. And I hear you are coming back around for baby number two. <laughs> You're looking to build your family again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any expectations with that of kind of what, what this journey will look like? No, actually. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, and, and in talking about disruptions, it's also important to recognize what that may potentially look like now that you have a child at home, right? And that sometimes changes things up a little bit of how you're going into situations because you're even more safeguarded. Mm -hmm. Yes. And your child's still little, um, so you're not necessarily you know, at a stage where she would understand the the brother sister terminology yet, but those are all things that we prepare families who have children um, how to how to deal with that if a disruption were to occur as well. So that's part of the education that you guys will go through the second time around. Yep. Well, we really appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your story. Um, we're grateful that our audience can learn a little bit more about the adoptive parent side of things during a disruption. It's a risk. It's a risk no matter what what path you take in adoption. But I think the more education, support, setting expectations, leaning on agency for support you have, the easier it is to get through a disruption. So thank you so much for tuning in and we hope to see you guys soon.